Today will be a special episode of Dimitri's Garage because I'm going to be interviewing the CTO of Adams Polishes. He was gracious enough to join me to discuss ceramic coatings, graphene, the hardness testing, slickness, durability versus longevity, some of the processes and ways that Adams formulates products, and just a ton of really exciting information that I think will be educational and interesting for many of you enthusiasts out there and just people wanting to learn more about the technology and chemistry involved. I know this is a longer video than I traditionally do, but I highly recommend watching it through to the end. There's just a lot of interesting content and discussion in there. Today we have Chris Gallagher with us uh, from Adams Polishes. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris. Yeah, thanks, I'm really, really excited to uh, to talk to you about ceramics, about Adams products. Uh, maybe you could tell a little uh, about yourself uh, for my viewers, sort of your education, your background. I went to uh, Colorado School of Mines here in Golden, Colorado. I've been in Colorado all my life, and um, I got a bachelor's in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry and a minor in economics and business. Been working with the Adams organization for about seven, yeah, seven years now. Much like a lot of our consumers, I'm a detail enthusiast and I enjoy uh, getting really nerdy about car care and um, all the different sort of metrics around it. Very cool. So could you tell us a little about what you do at your role at Adams? What's your day to day? Yeah. Um, so I lead a technical team at Adams and um, run some uh, meetings weekly regarding project stats and updates on um, R&D things. Things related to uh, chemistries, obviously, as well as hard goods, accessories, giftables, um, limited edition detail sprays, which everybody likes. We do a meeting every Monday morning. I like to call it show and tell, but it's it's a new product development committee that we have uh, all facets of the organization between operations, customer service, R&D, obviously, um, marketing, and uh, sometimes even our CEO joins and we basically go through um, new products that are on deck, whether we're reviewing a hard good or um, trying out a new chemistry, and we just kind of source feedback throughout the whole group. We also send out samples through a, uh, a tester network of ours that are in different climates, different sorts of uh, skill levels, different sorts of tastes, I guess. There's actually a lot that goes into vetting the products. Wow, that's really cool. I didn't know you guys, you know, had a tester network and did all, yeah. all of that kind of testing. I think the big thing that everybody wants to know and kind of how we got connected from my prior video is yeah. we were talking about ceramics, graphene products, and I kind of asked, you know, hey, is there a chemist out there that could join? And you very graciously agreed. So, uh, you know, kind of the big question on everybody's mind. So what is a really, what is true ceramic product? What makes a product ceramic? You know, how does, how does that work? Right. So fairly complicated answer, but I'll try and do it pretty quick. But a um, lot of confusion out there between silica, SiO2, yeah. ceramic. From a chemist's point of view, we reach for certain raw materials and we refer to them as ceramics. These are resins that um, covalently bond to the surface and they air temperature cure thanks to humidity in the air and they, they cure glassy and hard, very chemically inert. There's a whole other series of silicates and other sorts of specialty silicone formulations from manufacturers like Dow and others that give a very ceramic-like effect in the sense that they cure kind of glass-like. And I say glass-like because they're not actually glass. They get confused because they're both referred to as SiO2. Um, right. And that's perfectly valid because they're both the same building blocks of silicon and oxygen and things like that. From a chemistry point of view, there's certain raw materials that we as chemists would refer to as chemist, uh, sorry, ceramics. And we have other raw materials that when we formulate them, we'd refer to them as silica. So silica detailers, silica soap, stuff like that. More often than not, what you'll see is the water-based products are silicas or right. silicates. And the more solvent-based products tend to be things like silazanes and they're um, yeah. uh, a different nature of chemistry, even though they ultimately create kind of similar features. What was kind of new with the graphene products, at least from the Adams perspective, was we were able to take the ceramic resins we were already working with, react off some things that we didn't want on there that weren't uh, useful, so methyl mm -hmm. groups and stuff like that. And we reacted on purposeful ingredients um, like the graphene oxide. And then the black that you see in the products is heavily reduced graphene oxide, which is essentially graphene at that point. Very cool. Um, 
So see confusion also around the whole graphene versus graphene oxide formulations. Right. Yeah, because it's kind of weird. Some, you know, some formulations will say, you know, graphene, some will say graphite oxide. And so you're, you're kind of saying that your kind of flagship graphene products really do contain essentially graphene rather than just graphite oxide. Right. So they do contain graphene. It's more of an aesthetic change. Okay. Um, we did that purposefully um, as I've kind of helped make the marketing team be very forthcoming with but we purposely named them graphene ceramic coatings and things like that because it's a modified ceramic resin with graphene so there's legitimately graphene in there there's legitimately graphene oxide in there but we use the ceramic resins as kind of the anchor to keep those react to the surface and it kind of gives it um, almost like an armadillo plate in terms of making the resin more durable, having some more unique characteristics like higher sliding angles and um, more tight contact angles with water for beading. Yeah, so kind of on layman's terms, I guess the big thing uh, between a silica product and a ceramic product is, is the resin involved, the bonds, and possibly that they would contain um, solvents rather than you know a water-based carrier, right? Yeah, like I said, there's there's some things that we can emulsify into water-based systems fairly readily, like silicates, and there's certain things like the silazanes that do not like to go into water. What we discovered with the graphene products was once we made that modification of the resins, we could actually successfully react those with surfactants and get those pulled into water. And that's kind of where those waterborne um, formulations started arriving. But yeah, that's where most of the confusion happens um, is the silicates versus ceramics and the big benefits of graphene you were saying is kind of the contact angle and you were saying that it, it does offer additional protection so kind of when you mentioned that armadillo skin uh, is that are those the main benefits that one would see basically we tested the resins straight up so our original resin versus modified resins through lots of different baseline tests keeping everything else held we equal we are doing scrub testing with um, abrasion washability testers measuring contact angles throughout that scrubbing put them through QUV weathering cabinets to acceleratedly uh, blast them with UV put them through all kinds of real world tests much like what you do with washing panels um, by hand just to kind of see what sort of chemical resistance these products might have and then what we were seeing with the graphene products was higher durability which I like to highlight there's a big confusion with longevity and durability, but higher chemical and physical resistivity to wear, lower sliding angle, which people might consider as like a dynamic hydrophobicity where the water is already very hydrophobic, but it um, also runs off the surface a lot more readily. So right. ceramics are frequently kind of um, a problem when they come to water spine because of that heavy beating. What we saw with the graphene products was there's not as many reactive sites on the polymer, kind of free oh, okay. hydride groups to do work with. And that resulted in fewer water spotting or less durable water spotting. I know there's been some misconceptions out there about um, temperature dissipation, but that's more related to um, graphene and on more macro scale than what these nano coatings are doing. Yeah, because I've heard some people doing that kind of testing saying, oh, really heat resistive, but I was figuring at the very tiny microscopic scale, it's, it's probably unlikely to really have that kind of heat resistance like you would if it was a larger structure. But one thing that was interesting for me, you mentioned the water spotting, and I do have the graphene spray ceramic coating, the Adams uh, version, on my truck today. And actually, I posted a video yesterday, I believe, that right. showed how well it's still working. And one of the things that I have noticed is there are not a lot of water spots. So even right. after driving in that heavy rain and having, you know, the little beads everywhere, you pull into the garage and a few hours later, you're like, hey, it still looks pretty clean. I don't have little water spots everywhere. And that is interesting. I didn't realize that that was a function of the graphene. Right. It's also some of it, too, is, you know, the lower sliding angle means the water will yeah. evacuate a lot, little bit more readily and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. As soon as you hit the gas, it all comes flying off. And I'm almost, uh, I'm approaching a year with that stuff. So it definitely works. I, I kind of want to try the, uh, the liquid version uh, on the truck next and see how long yep. that lasts. You know, speaking of the two versions, what makes the big difference there? Because I do see that they both seem to have a solvent. At least it smells like solvent. Um, yep. what, what's the big difference between the spray bottle and the liquid? So obviously what we first engineered was the, I like to call it bottled coating, even though they're both in bottles, but yeah. um, the glass bottled coatings was kind of where we started. At one point while I was formulating, I needed to make a pint's worth of the of a lighter actives coating. So more solvent, less resin for somebody that wanted the surface to be more highly slick. These resins are very tacky, so less 
resin equals less tack. And uh, I decided to throw a sprayer into the product and it actually worked really well spraying it onto a towel and wiping it onto the paint. And I was like, we're onto something here. But essentially the best way to think of it is, is it's a coating light. So okay. it's a much more watered down coating in the sense that um, it's not actually got water in, but more solvent, less active ingredients, which ultimately makes it much easier to use, but you're going to put more of a veneer type of a coating on the surface rather than like a full blown high actives coating. So it can act as a really nice introductory product to people that might be nervous about applying yeah. a coating or someone that's not as invested in such a high level of durability that might come out of the more bottled coatings yeah. and just the ease of application is a lot higher of the spray products. And that makes a lot of sense. You know, that's one of the big things people ask me about coatings. They see my reviews and they say, you know, hey, I'd like to try this, but I'm a little scared. You know, I'm not sure I want to polish. I'm not sure, you know, that I'll wipe it all up correctly and not leave high spots. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were talking about in the video, we were talking about pencil. Well, I was talking about pencil hardness. Could you tell us a little more about pencil hardness, how it applies to coatings, what the values mean, you know, how the test is done? Yeah, you actually did a really awesome explanation on oh, it. Thanks. So I was really, uh, really proud to hear that from you. You're you're exactly right that the two scales get confused a lot between pencil hardness and Mohs hardness. I think some of that purposely is done with um, marketing and things like that. And maybe some of it's just plain ignorance, but what the pencil hardness test is testing is various levels of hardness of graphite. So on the pencil hardness scale, it goes from 9B to 9H. Um, there's also some 10B and 10 uh, H pencil manufacturers out there. And what it's doing is you're you're trying to apply force with that pencil to the surface. It's, it's sandwiched into like a little box car that weighs 500 or 750 grams. And it's putting a 45 degree angle of that lead on the surface. And the lead has to be polished in a very specific way to the ASTM method. But essentially what it's doing is trying to see if the coating is harder than the pencil. So you do a measurement at 9H and if it doesn't scratch, mar, or gouge the surface after five repetitions, if it doesn't do that on three of them, then you're done. And it's greater than nine H is the pencil hardness. If it does scratch mar or gouge, then you go down to the next hardness pencil and do an eight H and then down to a seven and then down to a six. Well, so it's a very legitimate yeah. test, yeah. but all of those measurements that you're doing on all those H's are all within about a one and a half to two on the most hardness scale. Yeah. So you're essentially, yeah. if you blow up the hardness scale, you're kind of goofing around in this small region. So, and that makes sense. And I think even the test is a lot like the most hardness scale. I mean, essentially you're seeing, you know, will a piece of steel cut this, will a diamond cut, you know, whatever, right? right? It's very similar. So is the goal to kind of compare different products and tell which one is going to be a little harder? Like maybe if I tried the liquid version of the Adams graphene coating versus the spray version, would there be a hardness difference there? Not typically actually. Okay. So, you know, going back to durability and longevity, durability as it relates to a chemist is what is the chemical and physical resistivity of the coating. So it's kind of irregardless of um, film thickness, whereas longevity is literally how long are you going to be able to keep that on the surface, which is sometimes a function of that durability, but it's also sometimes a function of adhesion and things like that. Yeah. So kind of how reactive to the surface is the coating. What you're trying to measure there is, is the coating harder than the substrate you're putting it on? So in the case okay. of like a clear coat, it's going to be gouged by pencils. Anyone that's had their car uh, keyed or something like that will know that the clear coat is definitely um, open to being damaged. So you can do it with your fingernail because your fingernails greater than even a graphite. You can take your oh, fingernail sure. and yeah. scratch off a pencil. So it's kind of, it's a very legitimate test, but it's all got to be taken into the right context in the sense that the coating is adding several magnitude of hardness to your clear coat, which is primarily interested in reducing marring or swirls caused by the washing process by hand. Or if you're driving it through a tunnel wash and having the brush um, going up against your car, it's going to help reduce the chances for that scratching and getting that spider web appearance you might see your vehicle have in the daylight. Yeah, and I know exactly what you mean about clear coat, especially, you know, it, it really depends on the type of clear coat they use, but some cars like Porsches are notorious for this. I mean, you can run your fingernails across the paint and it'll scratch it. Yeah, you look at it and it scratches. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But some some are pretty hard, you know, like Toyota, I think, is usually pretty hard uh, clear coat can be really right. hard to polish sometimes. That's right. It's, 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 it's a benefit and a disadvantage if it's not right. scratched. Because once it does get yeah. scratched, it's hard to fix it. 
Exactly, you got it. So a lot of people talk about how durable a coating is, how long it lasts. What is the difference between longevity and durability? Right, so I like to think of it as like going back to what you're saying about spray coating versus a bottled coating. You can think of it as the bottled coating is like a ream of paper and the spray coating is like a couple sheets of paper. So looking at them from above, they're both gonna be paper. They're gonna both scratch each like the same. They're both gonna be subject to getting wet or chemicals poured on them and behave the same. It's just the same as the coatings. But then if you were to wear away those stacks of paper one sheet at a time, you're gonna find the one that's only a few sheets of paper wear away and reveal the surface beneath a lot faster than on the one that's a ream of paper. So things that are given the same durability can have different longevities because of a function of film thickness. Film thickness then is going to be a function of how much resin, which is the limiting reagent in the product, is going to provide that surface. So whenever you wipe on one of these coatings and they start curing, you're going to have a theoretical film build that you can get depending on how well it adheres to the surface, how soon you wipe it off, how gentle you are when you level it, all those sorts of factors. Um, but no matter what happens, you're probably not going to get a higher film bill with the spray coating than the bottled coating because the levels of activity are so different. Gotcha. So they can have the same durability, but different longevities. So when you formulate products, you know, what do you normally shoot for? Like, is there a sweet spot or how, how do you determine how you want the product to behave? Um, we usually go into these projects with a goal in mind. Either there's like a technical push going on where we as the chemists are trying to highlight to the marketing team an opportunity or something cool that we've discovered. Or sometimes there's a commercial pull where it's like, we want to make a product that we can deliver that does X or Y. Reality is you usually end up in the middle somewhere where we try and make push the chemistry as far as we can. And marketing tries to uh, um, meet you halfway and say, my, maybe didn't do something ridiculous, but it was exactly what we were um, looking to accomplish in essence. Gotcha. Yeah. So it, that's very interesting to me because obviously I've, I've used a lot of your products. I'm a big fan of Adam's products in general. And um, for example, the uh, the liquid coating that I just tried, the graphene ceramic, you right. know, the durability was you know out of control. It was it was insane. And so I'm curious how longevity will be, obviously, when I apply it to the truck, you know, UV and, you know, external conditions and how it adheres and everything over yep. time. So that'll be very interesting. And so that product, would you say, was that was that more durability based or? Yep. It's the same basis of chemistry as the spray coating just cranked up um, in terms of actives. And so uh, what you'll see when you go to apply that is it won't be quite as easy to apply as the spray coating because the spray coating's higher quantity of solvent. Um, but what you'll what you will find is that it's going to leave a, a higher level or a higher film thickness on the surface. So usually what you can see is in a more appreciable gloss, the level of slickness might even be heightened by that higher film thickness. The longevity you're going to get out of the coating will be much greater. And it's literally because it's magnitudes more active. And so we kind of arrive at these at these um, longevities based off of um, empirical data that we get in the lab from doing all sorts of simulated tests like I was talking about earlier. And usually what we'll do is we can get something like 10,000 or 15,000 scrubs on the washability wow. tester. We might say every 10 scrubs back and forth is equivalent to one car wash. Then we make an assumption that someone's washing the car bi-weekly, so every other Saturday or something. And then that's how we get to a supposed years of durability, right? And then we cool. marry that with qualitative data from giving it to our tester network and people coming back and saying, it's been a year or it's been a year and a half and I'm seeing uh, the car bead like it was just applied, you know? And then we have yeah. other people that are applying it and abusing it and saying, when I put it through this hell of abuse and left it outside 24 seven, I didn't quite get as long as the other guy. So we kind of marry that all together, but usually, the best way to think of the years of durability is just an indication of that level of activity in the product. So if we say one's one year, and one's five, you can imagine that you're probably going to get somewhere on the magnitude of as much as five times as, as much durability out of one coating than the other, all else remaining equal. Yeah, you know what? I think that's actually pretty close given my testing between the liquid and the spray. Uh, right. version of, of the of the same product, the graphene ceramic. I, I think that 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 factor is, is probably pretty accurate. If I went back and looked, maybe it was a little more on the liquid, but it was it would have right. been a pretty close factor to that. So that's really interesting. I feel like products are getting really, really performant today as far as durability and longevity. You know, I think we're kind of in a almost a golden age, I would say, of, of really intense product performance. 
is the focus now towards ease of use? Is that why we're seeing so many, you know, rinseless products like Atom CS3? Absolutely. I mean, the innovation in the space is insane. The competition's very insane. But one kind of hallmark that I've always understood since I started formulating car care products was if the product's not easy to use, it's not worth a damn. Nobody wants to use a really frustrating product, no matter how durable it is, simply because it's not what people are going for when they go to detail their vehicle, right? They're looking for the ease of use and a nice experience. And that's why like with a lot of the Adams products, we have really cool scents in there. And um, I want like all the eye catching colors with the brand, but ultimately the product has to perform of course, but it's also got to be easy. And, and yeah. It's kind of funny because what I've found as a formulator is I can make a really intense formulation, high actives, and I can be like, this stuff's going to last like a super long time. Yeah. And if it's kind of streaky or kind of annoying to use, people will be like, eh, it sucks. And I'm yeah. like, but it's so good. And they're like, <laughs> not really. And yeah. then we, we give somebody something that's a little bit less active. And I'm like, it's not going to last nearly as long. They're like, but it's a dream to apply. Yeah. And it just seems like people gravitate to what's easy. So that has been my experience. Uh, I'm you know, really glad to hear that. You know, that's kind of your thought, too. Talking to friends and enthusiasts, people that are car guys, just because people are car guys doesn't mean they're detailing enthusiasts or professionals. Right. They still right. want a clean car. They still want to use good products. But, you know, that's the first thing they ask me when I tell them, hey, this product is like really strong, kind of has the qualities you're looking for. They're like, yeah, but is it easy? Like that usually tends to be the first thing they ask. One of the things we could talk about, uh, too, is slickness. So I do slickness testing. I kind of use the static uh, coefficient of friction approach to measure it, just kind of easier with the materials I have versus, uh, you know, trying to do dynamic or other things like that. Yep. And uh, for me, slickness has always been important because I see it as protection while you're washing. If the surface is, is really easy to run, um, you know, your sponge or mitt or whatever you're using across it, I feel like it's less likely to mar versus if you're having a scrub. And yep. the other question, this is kind of a two-parter, is well, what, what really affects slickness in these products? So you hit the nail on the head. So slickness isn't just an aesthetic benefit, but it tends to exaggerate self-cleaning effects as well as the ability for something to mar or scratch. So like going back to that pencil hardness tester, you would find basically the way to um, really do well on a gouge or scratch or mar sort of test would be to have very, very high adhesion for the coating and having this coating be very, very, very slick because then things kind of just tend to slide across it rather than to catch onto it and mar or like catch an edge and gouge. So it's absolutely true for car care as well that if the surface is really slick, it's not only um, fun to touch, but it's also um, just highly functional and practical in the sense of keeping the finish nice. Yeah, so I think this goes kind of hand in hand, but hydrophobicity, you know, sometimes people talk about, hey, this, this, this product isn't hydrophobic, it sheets. And I never really understood that to me, you know, true sheeting, like if I polish a piece of paint very well, it mm -hmm. will sheet because there's not defects in it that'll kind of cause the water to kind of break up a little bit. And if I apply a good wax, I can simulate that if I flood it with water. So if I right. just dump a bucket of water on it, yeah, it'll sheet off. But if I sprinkle it, it's hydrophobic. So to right. me, sheeting always felt like a true sheeting effect would be on a surface that is very well protected, very hydrophobic, rather than one that isn't hydrophobic. Because I don't understand how there could be true sheeting in a other than just water's cohesion, how there could be true sheeting in a non-hydrophobic product that you wouldn't get on just polished paint. Yeah, it all comes down to kind of free surface energy is what they would call it. So things like what the coatings is, they're not gonna do um, much sort of cohesive forces or any interaction on the water molecules. So they're free to ball up. They don't go perfectly spherical because of you have gravity and you have air pressure sure. and stuff like yeah. that. But the reality is, is yes, like water sheeting is a more practical product in the sense that it's going to make the surface more self-cleaning. It's going to make it a lot easier to avoid water spying and stuff. And as you highlighted, you can have a very hydrophobic surface. And if you flood it with water, all those molecules of water are going to have these Vayner walls interactions where they're, um, they're kind of yanking on each other. And so when you make a big sheet of water, it'll come off the surface very readily. The reality is, is you want to get some of both sorts of behavior and it, and it just comes down to what 
your surface is modified with, whether you're using like an amino functional silicone, which is going to give the silicone like an electrostatic affinity for mm -hmm. the surface. If you're using something that has a lot of um, wetters, which is stuff that's going to be very high energy and pull the water flat, or whether you're using something that's fairly inert, like the coatings, and it's going to let water beat up. Gotcha. So is there a way to get both effects out of a coating or are we really just looking at beading? Because it seems like if, if the sheeting can be created through an application of something that there may be, you know, value of having that in products. It sounds kind of like there are ways to engineer the, the sheeting. Right. So there's probably not been as much relevant science from like the reagent mod um, manufacturers like a Dow or something towards um, sheeting technology simply because it's probably something to do with it being harder as well as the populace as a whole has been taught to see beating gotcha. because as you said an unprotected vehicle will sheet water so then if you were to apply a product and it still sheets water yeah you're like did i do anything to this whereas once they see beating which naturally first came from things like waxes like a carnauba wax they were like protection is synonymous with beating but the reality is is you can get protection from both beating and sheeting it just has to do with what sort of what the composition of your coating is and um, what sort of reagents you're using and what sort of energy you're leaving behind on the surface. So in like the tunnel wash space, you might use some sort of like a quaternary ammonium um, surfactant or something to help emulsify ingredients that are typically hydrophobic, like a mineral seal oil, but those quads can actually add a lot of energy to the surface and flatten water. And what you get is coming out of like a tunnel wash is a beating and sheeting action simultaneously, which is mm -hmm. makes like the blowers really effective or like in yeah. the case of a detail enthusiast, makes your towels work better, makes your air blowers work better, whether you're using a leaf blower or an air cannon, or if you're accelerating the vehicle, the wind will blow the water off better if it's um, not perfectly hydrophobic or not perfectly hydrophilic. It's like you kind of want to be in the middle. Yeah, so that's something that I have to do more research on because one of the things that I've seen in my testing, I've never really applied a product that didn't start off beating. So right. for me, when I'm doing my sort of quantitative testing, I'm you know testing over and over and then I'm seeing that beating go away. You know, And usually the assumption, I can measure it with like a gloss meter and other things to see if it's still on the surface. So I can quantitatively see when it's gone. Uh, but I guess the interesting part is I've never really encountered a product that just starts off sheeting and right. I don't know if I anybody makes that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get what you're getting at. So, I mean, to me, sheeting is somewhat to do with the rate of sheeting. So a very not protected vehicle will sheet very, very, very slowly. Yeah. And if there's contaminants, they'll be left behind. If something's offering protection and sheeting, it should sheet a lot more rapidly as yeah. well as it should sheet clean as in like, you're not gonna leave a bunch of embedded contaminants and stuff behind. So that'd be kind of the difference I would look for. I think we're on the same page there because that's kind of what I've seen. You know, when a product is very hydrophobic and it, let's say it does create that sheeting effect when you put yep. a bunch of water on it, it, it instantly flies off. Right. You see it pull up for a second and then just disappear, but a well-polished piece of paint doesn't do that. I mean, the water clings to it. It just creates that sheet and very slowly, you know, drips down. And I think that you're right. I think that is the, the difference. Yep. So let's talk about contact angle. Uh, sure. How do you guys measure it? What's contact angle about? What are the benefits? The biggest nerdy thing to get, get into car care is like looking at contact angles from a quantitative standpoint. So we have instruments in our lab that you might have seen in marketing and stuff like that, that lets us take pictures of water droplets directly straight on through a really powerful camera. And we use software to put in tangential angles on where the water droplet meets the interface, which would be the substrate essentially. Anything that's equal to or greater than 90 is considered hydrophobic. Anything greater than 110 is super hydrophobic. Conversely, anything equal to or less than 45 is considered wetting or hydrophilic. Gotcha. So for us, we're able to differentiate between a 102 degree contact angle and a 110, whereas to most people on a vehicle, they'd be like, it's beating. It, it looks like beating. It, it's beating. Um, and they can't tell the difference. But for us, we're able to actually get into the nitty gritty of this one's 109. This one's 107. Uh, um, I'm not I'm not graphene. I can tell. I mean, those beads are gigantic and very round. Like it's very noticeable, you know, compared to other products. 
It's, yeah, and uh... it's kind of funny because like when you measure things like strictly carnauba waxes, they'll measure around 83 to 85. Yeah. So they're not even by scientific definition hydrophobic. Yeah. But people will still tell you when I wax a car, it beads. And it's like it does bead, but our definition of beading is very broad, yeah. probably from the yeah. 70s on up. You know, So um, <laughs> the coatings just give you a much tighter contact angle. And like I was saying before, the coatings are very inert, so they don't do interactions on water, but they also don't do interactions on acids, which are proton donors, and they don't do work with bases, which are proton acceptors. So basically, they're they're monogamous, and the silicon and the oxygen hold hands, and they don't want to date other people what, right. that are trying to react. What that means for the end user is contaminants don't stick as readily. So usually you don't have to reach for as harsh of chemistries. You don't have to um, scrub or braid as hard, which will help you avoid scratching and stuff. And it just makes the vehicle a lot more self-cleaning or what I like to say is maintenance friendly. Yeah. So that's kind of the practical benefits. And part of, part of that is the contact angle, which will, like you said, let water aggressively fall off the surface, which usually it'll then take those lightly contaminated surface and clean it by letting the water roll through it and pulling off dust like you might have seen in some pictures and videos yeah it's uh it's it's definitely something i've noticed like i think it really contributes to for example my truck staying cleaner like it's been raining every day here in houston and like literally we have it's i'm sure it's about to start we have like a 3 p.m monsoon that comes through and right. My truck, I've been washing it maybe once a month and it still looks pretty good. So I think it does make a big difference. I mean, I'm not driving it through the mud and stuff, but it, it, I think it does make a big difference with the contact angle. Right. You might be able to take a vehicle that was um, coated and just rinse it with fresh water and make it look like you just basically shampooed it. Yeah. Whereas a vehicle that doesn't have protection, you'll rinse it and it'll sheet water very slowly. And then what you'll realize once the water's gone is it still looks dirty. Um, so you have to agitate it more aggressively. You have to use a lot of surfactants to clean it. Whereas, you know, you can just get away with just a quick rinse with something like a ceramic coating. I want to move on to UV testing. So this one's sure. very interesting for me. I think there are so many opinions about this and so many different marketing materials and everything. But I've done some very basic UV testing using um, cyanotype papers, the word that I was looking for. And go. it's a very basic test, right? It's very quick. It's, it's a few minutes of exposure to UV, uh, UV light, UVA light. And uh, it shows you a big gradient of difference, right? If I apply clear coat, I see a very heavy difference in UV penetration through the surface that's had that clear coat on it. I have seen some effects with waxes, but you know they've been very limited. And I guess my hypothesis has been Due to the really thin layer, they're not really able to provide as much protection. But is there cumulative protection over time? Meaning, let's say it provides a little bit of protection, not as much as clear coat. Does that stack up over three years or five years? Or is, I mean, is my test flawed? Like, should I be doing something else? No, I wouldn't say it's flawed, but there's a lot going on there. So to unpack what you said, you use like the word UVA. That's right. There's yeah. UVA and there's UVB. Yeah. So like with humans, um, one will give you um, some skin redness and the other one will literally burn you yeah. um, and give you an inflammatory um, response on the surface. And so I think it's actually UVB that's a longer wavelength and it's higher penetrating, which is another word you use. Uh, I think it's, it's the other way around. So UVC is like man-made pretty much. It all gets stopped by the ozone, uh, ozone okay. layer. UVB uh, gets stopped by glass. So like UVB won't even go through glass at all. Got it. And UVA is the heavy penetrating one. So we used to think UVA was not unhealthy because it doesn't give you that crazy skin burn but right. it does penetrate through and cause damage yeah thank you for that but um the big point is is something like a wax is going to basically absorb radiation and melt so it's going to basically be mm -hmm. a sacrificial layer that's, that's fair other stuff like silicone technologies um and things like the coatings are going to give you light scattering so the light's going to hit it and it's going to diffuse it make it go out horizontally in like the case of like a matte surface or it's gonna hit and it's gonna bounce off in the case of a glossy surface. So it kind of deflects light. And then of course there's ingredients we can add in the formulations that are UV scavengers, which are basically things that tie up free radicals, which will do work with organic surfaces and break it down like your clear coat. So when your clear coat starts turning foggy or dusty, it seems like it's actually because there's UV radicals breaking yeah. down the organic bonds in your clear coats disintegrating yep. people will notice with things like coatings or or paint sealants and stuff like that that their clear coat won't get to that point and it's yeah. because you're either giving the surface a 
impenetrable layer that stops oxidative stress from happening to the surface, as well as reflecting or deflecting light. Or in the case of a wax, you're literally giving the radiation something else to Tomorrow. break down. Yeah. So it's kind of a sacrificial versus a preventative measure. Yeah. So we've yeah. got UV scavengers and UV radical inhibitors that we can build into like interior detailers and stuff that are what gives that product protection from breaking down um, the surface and UV light. Yeah. But would it be fair to say that the biggest, the most important thing to preserve, you know, your paint quality from fade is to preserve your clear coat. And part of that is ensuring that you're not abrading your clear coat when you're washing. So I think that's part of what the products provide. And then it does seem like they do provide some sacrificial layer or cumulative uh, protection over time. Maybe not as much as if you had just more layers of clear coat or, or, or am I wrong about that? Like, I guess I'm just trying to gauge how much protection a wax really gives versus the clear coat itself. <laughs> You're right. So in the case of a wax, that can also be organic. So it can break down just as readily, if not much more readily than your clear coat. Clear coats being organic, a lot of manufacturers do build in UV inhibitors and yeah. stuff, but they're limited, right? They don't yeah. last forever. So your vehicle will um, wear in an accelerated manner as time oh, goes yeah. on. But what these products are doing too is is just basically acting as protection for your protection. Yeah. So the clear coats on your car to protect your paint your paints on your car to aesthetically look nice, but it's also to protect the base metal. And so you've got protection on protection on protection on protection. And the reason why that is too, is because a lot of these different things have different vulnerabilities. So you're yeah. building in something that isn't as vulnerable, like an inorganic ceramic coating or something like that, that doesn't break down in UV light on top of something that is prone to breaking down in UV light. So it basically acts like a blocker or an interference between the vulnerable clear coat in the the environment yeah so that's 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 kind of what i was thinking because i think we everybody who's been an enthusiast in detailing we all know that cars that are well maintained that get waxed and washed regularly and the paint's cared for it lasts way longer i've seen cars that are four years old that look terrible compared to right. daily drivers that i might have had longer especially when i was younger and couldn't really afford to switch cars as often. Right. Yeah. So I, I remember I had my really old 99 Camaro and people would be like, is that paint new? Like, no, it's not new. I've just been, you know, waxing it and right. washing it all the time. So right. it, it undoubtedly does something. But like one of the things that I would always tell people who are polishing their headlights, a lot of them go, well, I'll just put a wax on it. I'm like, no, put a clear coat and then put a wax on it. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of the really, I think both help, but there is a big difference. I think some people misunderstand and they think, the wax provides just as much protection, so they'll put it just on a headlight or something like that that they've right. you know, taking off the UV protection by polishing. Right. And like like I said, it comes down to the durability and the durability going back is chemical resistivity as well, right? So yeah. a wax is also organic, so it's going to break down in the environment very quickly. So you're putting something that breaks down quickly on something else that breaks down quickly. So the level of protection offered isn't going to be maximized. And that's kind of why all these iterative improvements to silicone technologies and amino functional silicone technologies and resins, then ceramic coatings, and it just keeps going. So we're talking about UV and you mentioned earlier, you do accelerated weather testing and I'm assuming right. you do have, you know, UVA, UVB lamps in there and you do that yep. kind of testing. What sort of results are you seeing? You know, what, what do you shoot for? How do you use that? We have access to UVA lamps, UVB lamps. The cabinet is able to create dew points, so it's got a bath in it Ooh. that it can heat to make levels of condensation in there. So you can simulate different sorts of cycles will give you Death Valley where it's very hot in the when the lights are on and it's also similarly warm when the lights are off and there's almost no moisture or it can simulate the Amazon where it's very yeah. hot, um, very humid. Um, you can have it do some sh extreme temperature fluctuations where it's screaming hot in that cabinet and then it cools off considerably and kind of do some temperature stressing the stuff. But like you said, we will put in all kinds of different substrates, whether it be um, metals, clear coats, glass, um, polycarbonate, like headlights and stuff. And we'll coat them, uncoat them. We'll use various dressings and stuff and see how much something like a UV inhibitor that were sold by vendors is actually preventing 
damage to the surface. We'll look for discoloration. We'll look for cracking, fogging, all kinds of other things. Yeah, hopefully if my channel level ever blows up, I'll, I'll be buying one of those because I'm very yeah. interested in using one. <laughs> Tell us a little more about your work at Adams. You know, what is the most interesting stuff for you to formulate? Is there a favorite type of product or a favorite product you formulated? We've formulated quite a few different things. Um, obviously coatings and compounds and polishes, dressings, cleaners, the whole gamut. I would still say um, one of the more fun things um, for me to formulate is a lot of these detailers, like things like um, the CS3 is close to my heart because it's a jack of all trades, yeah. does a lot of different things in one, very approachable, very consumer friendly, but also the formulation is crazy complex because it's a rinseless wash along with an SiO2 detailer <coughs> um, smashed in the same product. So. A lot of ingredients in these, um, a lot of different emulsifiers and stuff used that make it very complicated to hold together, but then it makes such a beautifully easy to use product. Other things like uh, soaps and stuff may be pretty simplistic on a formulary standpoint, but they can be kind of dramatic with what sort of ingredients you build into it. Like the graphene shampoo was an interesting project. I haven't tried that one yet. It definitely seems pretty cool. The CS3, I think, is a really solid product. Actually, it's cool to hear that you enjoyed making that one so much. It's like, I love the smell of that product. I almost want to use it inside the truck everywhere just for the smell. It's, it's definitely a solid product. Yeah, it's it's definitely one of our higher volume SKUs. Yeah, very cool. So what is your favorite product overall? Is there something you really enjoy? I think products like Slick and Slide are super underrated. I just love how slick that that one makes the surface. Um, and it's, it's another one that um, when we showed it to Adam, he was like, we got to carry this. He's like, I don't know what need, what need it has in our product line or whatever. He's like, but this product's just fun and easy to use. And he wanted to have us carry it. And then we were goofing around internally calling it um, Slick and Slide. And our CEO thought that was pretty clever with the name. So he wanted us to uh, hold on to that. So that product was particularly fun. Yeah, that's. I think I've tested that one. I remember it being very slick. It's. Yeah. Uh, I remember when it, that came out pretty recently. It's a pretty new product, I think. It was a nuisance to formulate because everything we made just wasn't slick enough. So uh, how about the most misunderstood product? Is there something that you think uh, is really great but just hasn't gotten appreciation? I'd say water spa remover is one of those. It's it's one of those that in the professionals' hands, they rave about it. But it's it's a scary product for us to have launched because in – the wrong hands, it can cause issues. And if you look at like reviews on Amazon of various car care brands, almost universally one of their um, worst reviewed products will be their water spot remover. It's really difficult to have people not run into any situations that are undesirable when you're working with strong acids. I've seen a lot of people use it to wipe down a surface and then they throw the towel on the windshield and then they say it etched the glass. And I'm like, well, it's yeah. going to, it's acid. It doesn't care Oof. that it's not the surface you intended. So. Products like that, when used correctly, are phenomenal. When used incorrectly, are extremely frustrating for both the consumer and customer service and the technical team because it's a very needed product in car care, but it's something that, like I said, we are very apprehensive about launching because people can definitely get into trouble with that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll bet I have, oh, Yeah, definitely. But that um, that water spot remover is really interesting. I'm gonna have to try it out because I'll admit I haven't tried it yet. And But I think we've all been there where we have a car where the paint is still good. You don't really wanna polish it again. And you get those etchings from the water spots. And if it can really remove them, that's really exciting. So I think I'll definitely be ordering one of those and testing it out. So, um, you know, you've been in the industry a while. Uh, what's what's exciting for you? What do you see the industry going towards? What, what makes you excited and come into work every day? I guess to me, I just I just love the level of innovation coming out of practically every brand. It's something that uh, I've watched evolve over time where, you know, the car care space is a really hot place for a lot of investment. And so... There's a lot of brands that are getting new management and things like that. And they're just, you know, the chemists are definitely on point bringing out really cool formulas. There's a ton of development going on, even on the raw material side for things like tunnel washes and for um, car enthusiasts and in the professional market, and then all these resins for coatings and stuff. So it's just a very innovative space. It's not something that's like, yep, we're still 40 years later hawking the same wax. It's, it's like, it constantly evolving and it's very challenging every day to come into work and it seems like as soon as we launch something new it's already outdated because of how fast everything's yeah. moving it's so but crazy. It's, it's all legitimate and I, I think all the other chemists are doing an awesome job yeah i started off with actually adam's products in the late 2000s when i was kind of getting into cars and uh 
you know, getting into detailing, you know, like real detailing, not running it through the Mr. Car Wash or whatever. Right. I don't know what I was thinking back then, <laughs> but it's it's just amazing how many more products there are today. And just even just in the Adams lineup, I have not tried every Adams product because there's just so many. Right. And, and it's like every niche. And I think it is kind of really a golden age for detailing. I just I don't know how much bigger it can get, but it does feel like there's always new technology. So kind of rolling into that. What do you see over the next five years as being the big technological battle? You know, what's going to be interesting? What are we going to be developing? I think one thing that I've got my eye that I'm keeping or I'm keeping my eye on is like things like the relationship between PPF and coatings. Mm. So that's paint protection films and coatings. Um, right now, they they marry together very nicely in the sense that the paint protection films will offer things that the coatings can't. The coatings can do um, additional protection for the paint protection films. So they work very well together, but I'm seeing a lot of interest and a lot of development on paint protection films. And I think those are going to become more and more layman friendly and more and more commonplace in the sense that coatings are getting like built into things like the actual clear coat or coatings yeah. getting built into the PPFs so that you're kind of a jack of all trades. And that's just kind of where I see the space going, honestly. Do you see any future for PTFE based products? Um, to an extent, they're very hard to formulate with because it's so inert. The situations that you can use those in is very specialized and kind of niche in that sense. There's new things all the time. I, I came across the other day a PTFE emulsion. So um, certainly cool. possible. Yeah, definitely interesting. So, um, Chris, do you have any anything else you would like to talk about? Anything that, that that's interesting for you that we might have not covered in the video? Um, I just wanted to give you props, honestly. I, I really enjoy watching your channel. Oh, I you. think what you're doing is really cool in the sense that you're very educational and I'm always very interested in helping anyone that's interested in spreading the right information and being educational. You. So, you know, keep at it. And I really appreciate your diligence when it comes to the the science and the um, the measuring things and not being so anecdotal about it. So keep it up. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Chris. And, yeah. and I do try. Well, thank you for having me today. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, it was amazing talking to you. And I'm sure everybody's going to be really excited to watch this video. That was really interesting to me. I really feel like I learned a lot. There were some things that I feel were confirmed, you know, assumptions that I had been making. And really, thanks again, Chris, for this opportunity to talk to you and interview you. Very exciting. And hopefully I'll get to do more stuff like that in the future. And hopefully you guys out there watching this, you learned a lot and you also found value out of it. And if you did, I'd love it if you left me a nice comment, gave me a thumbs up. And of course, please do subscribe to the channel. It does mean a lot to me. I really feel like the community is slowly building and I love seeing some of the same people every time, being able to say hi to you again. It's really cool. So hope to see you down there and I will catch you again really soon. today and uh, some of it's coming out pretty good but overall this is a huge improvement from where I was like a month ago